Okay, hi everyone. So the name of my project is Nightwood as Gothic, Hauntings of Love and History in Juna Barnes's novel. Um, before I talk about the book itself, I'll just give you some background on what my research focuses on. I'm a second year English master's student at NYU and I did my undergrad at Sarah Lawrence, both in New York State. Um, the intersection of queer and Gothic literature is usually where I focus. And some buzzwords, interesting topics I've been interested in recently are spectrality, ghostliness, hauntings, monster studies, bodily otherness, and monstrosity. I'm also interested in Gothic in the context of popular fictions. Some other work I've done on um, has been on genres like lesbian pulp fiction, which is, which is this the genre of literature from the 1950s and 60s in America, like dime store novels, kind of anything that's um, seedier kind of fiction and why we categorize it that way. Uh, I've worked on Frankenstein, trans identity, and literary and bodily construction. In addition to Juna Barnes, I've um, researched Virginia Woolf, Radcliffe Hall, other queer modernists. And my current research, which I'm considering writing my thesis on, relates to queer hauntings and Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House and Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. Um, the Henry James inspired much of The Haunting of Hill House, the, the, the types of hauntings. So I think there's going to be some interesting connections there, but that's very um, in the formative stages. So we'll see what that happens, what happens with that. This is a picture of Juna Barnes. Um, in case you've never seen her before, or heard of her, uh, that's what she looked like. She was a, a very interesting figure. Um, I'll give you all some background on her. She was a queer American modernist born in 1892. <clears throat> but I don't think she would have labeled herself as queer. She would have probably rejected the label lesbian, but I'm using them when I talk about her as lenses through which we can explore her work. This may be an anachronism, but if we're keeping that in mind, that that wouldn't have been the word that she would have used, or at least not at the time. I think that allows us to bring our contemporary understandings of queer existence to the past without um, assuming that things were the same back then as they are now. She was a journalist, illustrator, author, and playwright, and while she's primarily known for Nightwood, she's also the author of A Night Among the Horses, Ladies Almanac, Rider, and the Antiphon. Oh, another really interesting one, which I recommend, is The Book of Repulsive Women. It's like a little book of pictures and drawings um, and, and poems. It's very interesting and strange. And she expatriated to Paris, so she was part of that expatriate American, and not just American, but community within Paris. Um, this is a, these are pictures of the covers of the book across time. I believe the one on the left, it might have been an original cover because it was originally uh, published by Faber and Faber. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Faber, Faber. Um, and then the one on the right is, I believe, the most recent edition. That's the one that I am reading from. And the introduction was written by Jeanette Winterson, who I'm a big fan of. She's a, she writes a lot of gothic stuff, too. Um, so some background on the book, published in 1936, an, an early example of explicitly lesbian literature um, depicted relationships between women explicitly. Um, the novel makes use of Gothic and modernist elements. And interestingly, T.S. Eliot famously wrote the original introduction. So basically any copy of the book that you get, even if it has a different introduction, it's going to have T.S. Eliot's introduction. Um, it's uh, the, the novel features characters loosely based on the people in her life. So Barnes and her real life lover, Thelma Wood, uh, appear in the novel as Nora and Robin, who I'm gonna be talking about a lot when I talk about the novel itself. In terms of the structure, it's broken up into separately titled chapters, almost like, mono they're not all monologues, but each, there's, there's a lot of monologue-like elements. There'll be characters kind of rambling on for pages and pages. So it doesn't have a very conventional structure. It of course is a work of modernism an understudied work of queer modernism. And I believe that we should be talking about Nightwood because there's a need to, uh, to analyze this novel through a Gothic lens, which I believe opens up queer interpretations as well, because I'm very much about noticing the connections and the almost inherent um, intermingling of the queer and the Gothic. So just two texts that focus on Barnes herself that I am drawing from are these two books, which I'll go into now. Are Girls Necessary? Lesbian Writing in Modern Histories by Julie Abraham, written in 2008. Um, Julie was my professor at Sarah Lawrence. Um, the chapter Juna Barnes' Memory and Forgetting was very helpful for me in structuring this paper because it talked about queerness, memory, and tenuous connections to history, which I think is very important to Nightwood because all of the characters are struggling or hoping to find legitimacy in spite of their otherness by connecting themselves to history in some way. And then a more recent compilation, Shattered Objects, Juna Barnes's Modernism, edited by Elizabeth Pender and Catherine Setz from 2019, um, talks about 
uh, Nightwood, not just Nightwood, Barnes's work in general in the context of several different things like modernism, animal studies and inhumanisms, which I think also can very much be a Gothic um, way of looking at things, style and queerness. So I think where, where I feel the, the most logical next step to go from here is bringing together the queer and the Gothic when looking at this text. Um, one more important text that I might just want to bring up before I get into the heart of the paper is this, um, this book, The Apparitional Lesbian by Terry Castle. Um, the, the title is also the title of the essay that I worked with, The Apparitional Lesbian, 1993. Talks about lesbianism in literature as a form of haunting. Queer lovers cannot be seen by the mainstream eye, but in spite of the fact of this erasure and this invisibility, these lovers are felt by the weight of their absence. So it's almost like queer readers, or if you're reading queerly, you can pick up on when queerness is happening almost because it's unsaid or unspoken. And without further ado, I'm just gonna put up this picture of Juna Barnes and Thelma Wood while I get into the heart of my paper itself. So the title is Nightwood is Gothic, Hauntings of Love and History in Juna Barnes's novel. Juna Barnes described her 1937 novel Nightwood as the story, the story of a soul talking to itself in the heart of the night. Indeed, the novel is largely haunted by self-reflection, the exploration of oneself through one's connection to history and to one's own lover. The novel tells of Felix Volkbein, a Jewish man trying to create a story of Christian ancestry for himself, his wife, Robin Vogt, a woman who feeds off of the love of others to make herself feel real, and Nora Flood, the woman who loves and loses her. Dr. Matthew O'Connor, who proclaims that he should have been born a woman, is the observer of their woes and tells of his own, taking on a role akin to that of a chorus in a Greek tragedy. This haunting search for oneself is a Gothic trend which appeared in Barnes's modernism. And while psychoanalysis alone only examines psychological phenomena in terms of sex and gender, pathologizing these self-conceptions, the Gothic and Freudian tropes of the uncanny and melancholia illuminate the hauntings in the novel. My reading of the novel is gonna make use of these tropes and I'll provide a discussion of how queerness and historical positionality shape the novel's hauntings of love and history. According to Freud, the uncanny is that species of the frightening that goes back to what was once well-known and had long been familiar. In Barnes's novel, this uncanny feeling arises from the meeting of a lover of the same sex. Melancholia takes over and the failure to achieve connection to this lover results in a deep sadness and incorporation of the lover into one's psyche. Although psychoanaly psychoanalytic phenomenon may prove useful in terms of exploring characters' relationships to sex and gender, there are more historical factors at play in the novel. Nightwood draws upon many long-standing traditions of the Gothic, such as the desire and failure to find legitimacy through ancestry, as well as the perhaps homosexual desire to discover oneself through a familiar love. That is, if we're to consider homosexuality as a desire for sameness, which is debatable. Yet Barnes and her writing resist classification as lesbian or queer. These terms are more effective as lenses rather than as identities when examining the Gothic nature of the novel. It is in the context of haunting that Nightwood finds its place within and beyond the Gothic genre. The novel demonstrates that what is to be feared is both human and familiar, often hidden within oneself. I will argue that as the hauntings within Barnes's novel are gothic and queer, the desire to be a part of legitimate history and love looms over this story of characters who are haunted by the world, by their lovers, and by themselves. This love and loss in the gothic and in Barnes's novel is queer in its exploration of the idea that the loss of a same-sex partner is like the loss of oneself. Homosexuality is not always considered in terms of the sameness of partners, but there is a recognition in the novel that Nora and Robin are connected by gender and fate. As Dr. O'Connor says to Nora, a woman is yourself, caught as you turn in panic, on her mouth you kiss your own. As Terry Castle argues in The Apparition of the Lesbian, to be a ghost is to long unspeakably after one's own sex. At the same time, the demonic opposite is also true. To love another woman is to lose one's solidity in the world, to evanesce and fade into the spectral. Because love between women cannot exist, quotes, women who love their own gender become ghosts in the Gothic genre. As I will argue here, while the melancholia of the Gothic is often the result of the loss of a forbidden love object, Barnes's novel does not depict homosexuality as psychologically forbidden. Rather, the melancholia in Barnes's novel arises from the liminality of queer people's existence, the sense of being neither this nor that, neither here nor there, and the character's alienation from history because of this otherness. Because this despair is not simply about the forbidden nature of queer sexuality, but also about characters' positionality within society, psychoanalysis alone cannot account for such desolation. In his book, Skin Shows, Gothic Horror and the Technology of Monsters, which I highly recommend, it's a great book, Jack Halberstam notes how, while Gothic narrative technologies deploy otherness as a multi-layered body marked by race, class, gender, and sexuality, only a psychoanalytic model of interpretation insists upon the essential link between psychosexual pathology and monstrosity. 
Psychoanalysis's insistence on psychological pathology does not acknowledge the ways in which societal positionality affects these characters. Felix's queer subject position within the novel is the result of his Jewishness, which excludes him from legitimate ancestry, forcing him to create a false story of his origin. The novel begins by describing Felix's lineage, which, despite, which, which exists despite a well-founded suspicion as to the advisability of perpetuating that race, which has the sanction of the Lord and the disapproval of the people. Echoes of Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto surround Felix's story as he looks to his false portraits of his grandparents to create a narrative for himself. Much like how in the castle, Manfred is haunted by the portrait of Alfonso, the former ruler of Otranto, to whom he is not related and from whom he does not inherit legitimacy. So if you'll uh, see this picture I have up here, which I think was included with one of the original editions of the Castle of Otranto, those, um, those pictures, those paintings that you see up there are false portraits, uh, fake ancestors invented to, to, to achieve a sense of legitimacy. Nightwood alludes to and expands upon the Gothic genre, exploring how individuals in queer subject positions face hauntings, either by history or by their own lovers and therefore themselves. As Julie Abraham writes in her book, Are Girls Necessary? Lesbian Writing in Modern Histories, Barnes's characters are frequently as concerned about their relation to history as they are about their responses to each other. Recent literary scholars have continued this conversation around Barnes's and other modernist relationship to history. Exploring the Gothic legacy continued by modernists and reclaiming the Gothic for the queer elements inherent within its structures. Elizabeth Pender and Catherine Setz's 2019 book, Shattered Objects, Juna Barnes's Modernism, is one text that has examined Nightwood's role within and outside of the trends of modernism, as well as the novel's queerness and resistance to such a label. Nightwood carries a sense of illegibility, which is due to its anti-essentialist nature and illegibility in many senses. It's a very difficult to read book, hard to make sense of. You have to read it a lot of times, I think, to get it. Um, loss within relationships mirrors characters' loss of connection to history, a pattern that I'll argue is gothic and queer. Okay, so returning to psychoanalysis, here is a picture of Freud. Um, this need to possess a lost lover is the form of gothic haunting in that a lover is a reflection of one's lost self. Freud's concept of melancholia, which he articulated in this essay, Morning in Melancholia from 1917, um, Within this concept of melancholia and object loss, which is withdrawn from consciousness, th this appears throughout the Gothic. Barnes's characters conf confirm Freud's idea that melancholia is self-depleting, resulting in an extraordinary diminution in one's self-regard and impoverishment of one's ego on a grand scale. Um, and also Freud writes, but the free libido was not displaced onto another object, it was withdrawn into the ego. So when, you, when a person loses another person or an idea or an object, and you can't displace it onto something else, or you don't displace it onto something else, it gets withdrawn into oneself, um, which is a kind of a way, an unhealthy way of having that lost object or person live on. And then Judith Butler expands, a point, expands upon Freud's ideas in a gender and sexuality studies context, considering how melancholia applies to homosexual relationships and gender identification. Butler writes that in the case of same-sex gender identification, the unresolved object relations are invariably homosexual. Indeed, the stricter and more stable the gender affinity, the less resolved the original loss, so that rigid gender boundaries inevitably work to conceal the loss of an original love that unacknowledged fails to be resolved. Um, so if, uh, if society, for example, doesn't recognize the original relationship as even existing when that relationship ends or, is, or a lover is lost, it's that much more difficult to comprehend what that loss means. In the case of the same-sex pairing, such as that of Nora and Robin in Nightwood, there's an intense identification with the object of desire who also shares one's aim of desire, for example, to be and to desire a woman. Therefore, when lovers share a gender affinity, the loss of one is not easily resolved because societal gender constructs work to conceal the, the loss of an original love. So now I'm going to turn to three trends at Nightwood that I feel illuminate the novel as a gothic exploration of loss and exclusion. The first, Felix is grappling with his connection to history reflects the need to invent lineage for legitimacy. The second, Nora's loss of Robin, reflects self-diminution and the sense of invisibility that comes with this failed relationship between women. The third, Dr. O'Connor's lamentation over the womanhood he, he feels he cannot possess, demonstrates the desire to create one's own story when conventional history allows for no such narrative. So let's start with Felix. By beginning the novel with a description of Felix's origin and references to the bifurcated wings of the House of Habsburg and the Volkwein arms, the story immediately becomes about lineage. So I'm just going to read through this paragraph. This is the very beginning of the book. 
Early in 1880, in spite of a well-founded suspicion as to the advisability of perpetuating that race which has the sanction of the Lord and the disapproval of the people, Hedwig Volkbein, a Viennese woman of great strength and military beauty, lying upon a canopied bed of rich spectacular crimson, the valence stamped with the bifurcated wings of the House of Habsburg, the feather coverlet and envelope of satin on which, in massive and tarnished gold threads, stood the Volkbein arms, gave birth at the age of 45 to an only child, a son, even days after her physician predicted that she would be taken. So you, the, the language immediately is about lineage, history, these symbols that evoke history, family, um, which are supposedly things that give you or your family a sense of legitimacy. In giving birth to Felix, the Christian heiress Hedwig Volkbein is continuing the Jewish line of her husband Guido. The attention to the arms of the House of Habsburg is Gothic in its insistence on heritage, something for which Felix will strive throughout the novel. Julie Abraham writes that Guido's outcast status is only emphasized by his concern for his place in history, his manufactured genealogy and title, and his ancestral portraits that are really studies of, of a forgotten actor and actress. Felix inherits his father's place and his preoccupation. His race and his relation to history will be his two most important characteristics. Barnes describes Guido's fear that he will not have an heir, a fear that is manifold, also embodying the anxiety of the Jewish people over lineage. Writing, and childless he had died, save for the promise that hung at the Christian belt of Hedvig. Guido had lived as all Jews do, who, cut off from their people by accident or choice, find that they must inhabit a world whose constituents, being alien, force the mind to succumb to an imaginary populace. Guido pretends to be Christian and invents a story of his ancestors so that he can have a claim to history. Okay, so now let's turn to Nora, another example. This search for legitimacy through history is a desire to create memory, a need which drives Nora's story as she loses Robin. Abraham describes how in Nightwood, memory is an attempt to hold love. When Robin leaves Nora for the wealthy Jenny Petherbridge, Nora is consumed by melancholia that forces her to create an image of Robin that she can keep within her mind and heart. And this is what Barnes writes. Love becomes the deposit of the heart, analogous in all degrees to the findings in a tomb, as in one will be charted the taken place of the body, the rema, the utensils necessary to its other life. So in the heart of the lover will be traced as an indelible shadow, that which he loves. In Nora's heart lay the fossil of Robin, intaglio of her identity, and about it for its maintenance ran Nora's blood. Thus the body of Robin could never be unloved, corrupt, or put away. Robin was now beyond timely changes, except in the blood that animated her that she could be spilled of this fix, the, the walking image of Robin in appalling apprehension in Nora's mind, Robin alone crossing the streets in danger. And so the, the particular moments of language I would point out in this, um, in this passage are the fossil of Robin, intaglio of her identity, beyond timely changes because she's been absorbed into Nora's mind, um, the spectrality of it. Barnes's description is both Freudian and Gothic. Nora is incorporating her lost love object into her psyche and doing so in a way that equates Robin with a corpse. Barnes again employs the language of the spectral by imagining Robin as an indelible shadow. The lesbian love between these women is palpable yet cannot exist. Nora's heart becomes a tomb which will hold Robin's image. It is only an image of Robin which can exist to Nora, an intaglio of her identity. Robin becomes a ghost, a walking image which haunts and attracts Nora. So although Nora loses Robin. Robin is no longer there in a physical sense to her. It's this psychic or this, this mental mark, this, this scar that, that remains. And in that way, Robin still exists to Nora within her mind. Uh, Robin is a lover who cannot exist and therefore becomes like a ghost who is both seen and not seen. In her essay, The Apparitional Lesbian, Terry Castle explores this loss of reality by identifying lesbianism as a haunting. And she writes, the kiss that doesn't happen, the kiss that can't happen, because one of the women involved has become a ghost or else is direly haunted by ghosts. Lesbian relationships are considered non-existent because of the threat that sexual love between women inevitably poses to the workings of patriarchal arrangement. Lesbianism's challenge to heteronormativity creates the, ne the necessity for society to deny the existence of love between women. When Dr. O'Connor speaks to Nora about Robin, he says, and do I know my sodomites and what the heart goes bang up against if it loves one of them? What do they find then? That this lover has committed the unpardonable error of not being able to exist, and they come down with a dummy in their arms. And it's this language of the lack of existence, not being able to exist, that is at the same time a means of existing in and of itself, at least for queer characters within stories like this. Nora struggles with the feeling that Robin was so real to her, and now she cannot possess Robin, who becomes like a dummy. Nora can only maintain her image of Robin, who is, as 
Barnes describes herself within her memory. And now lastly, I'll turn to Dr. O'Connor. As these characters mourn their exclusion from history and their lost loves, Dr. O'Connor laments the female version of himself that could never be. Born in, quote, the wrong body, Dr. O'Connor's society prevents him from taking part in the true record of history and love. Yet Barnes continues her objective of finding a place for lost characters in the worlds they create, making the doctor a wise person despite his suffering. Felix thinks that the doctor's fabrications seem to be the framework of a forgotten but imposing plan, some condition of life of which he was the sole surviving retainer. His manner was that of a servant of a defunct noble family whose movements recall, though in degraded form, those of a late master. Although O'Connor is demeaned in his metaphorical role as servant to a family which no longer exists, Barnes makes him the keeper of that history. Nevertheless, O'Connor's story is one of longing for a life which he knows to be his destiny, but which he can never have. He asks, why is it that whenever I hear music, I think I'm a bride? It becomes clear that as someone who exists within the liminal idea, the, the liminal area of identity between man and woman, O'Connor is excluded from both history and love. Felix notices the melancholy hidden beneath every jest and malediction that the doctor uttered. O'Connor cannot be a woman, he cannot be the woman he feels himself to be in the world he inhabits, yet he imagines the woman he might have been in a past life. And now this is the, uh, the quote that I have up here on the screen. In the old days, I was possibly a girl in Marseille thumping the dock with a sailor, and perhaps it's that memory that haunts me. The wise men say that the remembrance of things past is all that we have for a future. And am I to blame if I've turned up this time as I shouldn't have been, when it was a high soprano I wanted and deep corn curls to my bum, with a, wo with a womb as big as the king's kettle and a bosom as high as the bowsprit of a fishing schooner? Um, so within the same language, it's always memory which is tied to hauntings. Uh, O'Connor knows that this is the life he is meant to have. He, he feels that this is the, the woman that he is, but because that's impossible in the world that he inhabits, he is forced to create this idea, this story that he's telling within his mind, but I, I suppose also within the pages of this book as he's telling the story. Although Dr. O'Connor is not recognized as a woman by his society, he is a woman in his own story, legitimizing the story through history. And I'll just close with this. Like many Gothic stories, Nightwood is as much about love as it is about death. The two concepts are connected as love becomes a fear of loss and death becomes an immortalization of love. Depictions of death within the Gothic laid the foundation for Freud's idea of melancholia. Those, whose lovers, those who lose lovers to death carry their dead lovers within their minds, and those who cannot find connection to history imagine their own histories. The spectral take on lives of their own, haunting the Gothic and modernism. In Barnes's novel, characters who are outside of the record of mainstream history are immortalized by love and death and the stories they create. Nora, Robin, Felix, and Dr. O'Connor are mythologized, achieving a kind of legitimized existence within the novel, even if these characters do not find legitimacy within their own world. The Gothic genre and Barnes's novel serve as ways of understanding oneself within and outside of literary and historical tradition. Knightwood assured Barnes's place within history while being a story about the inability to do so. The love between women, which seemingly could only exist in death, also exists in literature. The novel makes the spectral image of the apparitional lesbian visible and the ghosts of lovers become real. If love is the deposit of the heart, so is Barnes's novel. So that's the end of my paper, but I will leave you all with some ideas about where we can go further in terms of studying the novel and then maybe just some questions that you could or could not answer, whatever, feel free um, to jump in later. Um, so I'm not the first person who's talked about this, but I think there's more to be said about the idea of Dr. O'Connor, trans identity and literary self-creation, um, the telling of stories as a means of recreating or recreating oneself. I think it could also be interesting if more people were talking about Nightwoods and indeed Juna Barnes is herself, resistance to the label of lesbian. Uh, could we say that lesbian is an outdated term or maybe it never applied to the novel? Um, or maybe it's just better, like I said, to use as a lens to explore the novel. Um, and while the story may not be about queerness or at least the conflict in the novel isn't driven by queerness, it's not that these characters are miserable because they're queer. Nevertheless, this queerness goes hand in hand with this haunting, um, this kind of desolation. Queerness is driving the story in many ways. And does this maybe open up a non-binary reading of Nightwood, which is not to say that any particular character is non-binary, but is Nightwood one of those stories that kind of falls between the cracks, Is cannot fall into either this category or that, the characters themselves, what's it about all of this? Um, I think it would also be important to talk about Nightwood from a racial ideology perspective, um, racial ideologies and exclusions. 
perhaps Knight would through a lens of critical race theory. There was a very interesting um, essay related to mourning and melancholia and Chang um, talking about uh, melancholia in a racial sense and the idea that the excluded racial other within a nation actually in many ways defines the nation. The nation can't exist without the other. Um, the, the excluded racial other almost gets incorporated into the mind of the nation. The nation builds itself in response to those who are excluded. And then another interesting, I think, topic which could relate to monster studies is in humanisms. Nightwood is very often talked about in the context of animality. There's many references to birds, beasts, dogs. So would discussions of the animal force us to reevaluate the very meaning of the human? And how could all these lenses apply to the Gothic? Is it simply that the other instills fear and yet has the potential to be reclaimed? And then just lastly, a few questions. I know we talked about this at the beginning. Had any of you heard of Nightwood? Had you read it before? Do you feel that the Gothic is inherently queer? Um, I recommend you all maybe reading George Haggerty's book, Queer Gothic, if you're interested in the connection between the queer and the Gothic. And maybe how does this research fit into contemporary Gothic conversations? Um, what are the most interesting sticking points about uh, Gothic studies today and how does Nightwood fit into that? Um, do you think I missed anything in terms of lenses I'm using in my research to approach the novel? And lastly, since a lot of my work relates to queer theory, I'm interested in the Gothic not only as a literary, but also as a social phenomenon. And how do we carry the Gothic into our social world? How does it inform the ways that we think about each other, about the way that we categorize people? And how does that in turn inform contemporary Gothic novels that are being written? Um, and with that, here's my work cited page. If you have any questions about sources that I've used or how to get, um, how to access any of this or how to, uh, any other sources that I might have used or if you wanna read any of these, just let me know. Um, so I'll stop the share, thank you.